My name is Scott Bootler. I'm the Wiesman Academy instructor uh, here in Langley, British Columbia, and I want to welcome you all to today's Troubleshooting Fault EE and EB webinar. This presentation is part of a growing technical training series, and the objectives of this series are to share some proven methods with you all uh, of tracing and correcting faults. Our specific audience here is obviously qualified trade technicians uh, that we wanted to share this information with. And we also want to create a virtual medium for you uh, that will support our product documentation. Uh, and this will be a resource for you uh, as we move forward. Joining me uh, virtually by my side today uh, is from our Wiesman Academy uh, headquarters in Waterloo, Ontario, uh, our instructor, Mark Norris. Hi, Mark. How you doing, Scott? Um, doing good. So uh, Scott and I are doing our social distancing part. He's in BC and I'm in Waterloo, Ontario. So we're uh, we're, we're doing our social distancing bit. Uh, That's right. Just a little we're looking after you here for you guys. Um, there are so there's a on your little menu you have on your on your screen. You should see a box for questions. Uh, ask questions as we go along. Uh, if there's something that I can answer quickly in a, in a couple of sentences, I'll do that and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go through that way. Any question that looks like it's going to need a little bit more time to explain, I think we'll, what we'll do is I'll kind of hold on to those to the end. Uh, if there's a answer uh, question that you give out, I will respond to the whole group with it unless you specify, specify that you just want me to answer it to you. Uh, so the default will be I'm going to answer to everybody and your, they'll see your question and your answer. Uh, don't let that not make you answer or ask a question because if you're asking it somebody else wants it too so uh, i'm going to give Absolutely. it back to scott and he can carry on here but uh, we're gonna you know, there will be a recording of this by the way at the end uh, eventually it will be up on the uh, uh, beastman canada website under the webinars and probably in our youtube channel as well i just want to add on to that just a little bit before we, we get going uh, the webinar is scheduled for about an hour uh, I practiced it a couple times, and with the information here, we're going to go probably a little past an hour, I'm anticipating, not by much, uh, but uh, if you have to, uh, you know, if you, if you basically allocated an hour and that's all you've got here, you can't, uh, you can't stay with us, then that's fine. You can still post those questions because we can get back to you uh, via email or some other type of medium as well. So if you, you, have, to, uh, you have to end before we end. Uh, then, uh, you know, still don't hesitate to ask those questions um, so that we can get that information to you. Uh, so now that we've kind of finished all the introductions here, you've uh, introduced uh, myself and Mark and you know who we are. Uh, let's get this uh, presentation uh, going. So we're going to have a look at uh, troubleshooting fault EE and EB today. So we're going to get uh, see how this all works out for us as we move through here. Uh, first, have a look at what we are, what we anticipate you may see these faults occurring on, uh, impacting out there in the field. So when you're at a site or at somebody's home, uh, the boilers that you see in front of you are the ones that will uh, possibly have or be impacted by the two faults that we're going to cover today. Uh, we'll have a little brief look at these uh, with a little bit of added information. Uh, typically, Mark and I will, you know, spend a whole day on, you know, just one of these boilers or some of these topics. We're going to try to kind of cover this in a fairly quick fashion. Uh, first boiler we'll look at on the left-hand side here is the uh, VODENS 222F uh, B2TB125, 125,000 V2 boiler. Uh, there is uh, one model in this particular uh, unit of, of boiler that we have. It's a combi boiler. Uh, so it uh, is a space heating as well as a domestic hot water production kit uh, is installed on it. External heat exchanger, uh, 26 and a half gallon stainless steel storage tank. Uh, so as far as a combi boiler goes, that tank really doesn't even have to be hot. And if you're drawing uh, water uh, for a shower or washing dishes or whatever, the heat exchanger will uh, pump out that heated water directly to your fixtures. 
uh, but you get that added punch of that uh, 26 and a half gallon tank there for those uh, larger domestic hot water loads. So pretty impressive uh, performance uh, out of a combi unit with 125,000 B2s of maximum input. So think about that, just a two inch vent on that, uh, and you're getting a pretty good performance out of that particular unit. Uh, it is a B series uh, uh, designation as far as the, you see the little red uh, highlighted B there in the nomenclature. That's to designate a second generation of boiler. So there was a B2TA, a unit that was produced a number of years ago. This is the the uh, the new updated generation uh, series uh, number two. And the difference primarily is in the heat exchanger. So that's why I've got a picture of the heat exchanger up there. For those of you who weren't sure what that looked like, uh, this is a cross section of the B series heat exchanger. And in this particular unit, there's a baffle plate installed. And the baffle plate effectively separates the combustion side of the boiler with a flame and the burner tube, and et cetera, would be uh, producing the flame and the temperature and separates that from the vent side of the boiler. Uh, as this unit is operating, so the burner's firing, that flue gas is forced around that baffle and back to the uh, backside of the heat exchanger. Uh, the separation also separates the return water side of the boiler from the hotter supply water going out to your heating system. So as the flue gas moves through there, the hottest flue gas hits the hottest temperature uh, fluid in the heat exchanger. And then as it goes around the backside of the heat exchanger, it, it gets in contact with the colder return water coming back from your system. The idea here is that we pull that flue gas temperature down. That's going to increase your combustion efficiency. General rule of thumb, basically, you know, I think it's about every 35 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm sure people out there can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, that will, if you drop your uh, stack temperature by about 35 degrees Fahrenheit, that's going to increase your combustion efficiency by approximately 1%. So the added value there is just in the, trying to drop that uh, temperature of that flue gas down. Obviously important for condensing boilers. That's another subject for another day as far as uh, dew point temperatures, et cetera. Uh, so that's your heat exchanger in a B2TB, really a residential boiler. You won't see these in uh, many commercial applications. Uh, next to it, we have 10 models of the B2HA and B2HB boiler. A lot of you guys uh, uh, do work on these units. You can find these in residential standalone applications, multiple boiler applications and commercials. You can have about eight boilers on, say, a Cascade system, for instance, uh, with these particular units. The first five boilers uh, in the uh, B2H uh, series are of the second generation. So the first five from 68,000 maximum input up to 199,000 B2s of maximum input have a very similar heat exchanger to the B2 TV we just talked about. Same concept, same idea behind why we put the baffle plate in there. Uh, so there's five uh, of that 10 are in that particular size. Then we move into a B2HA 285 to 352. There's three models. So there's another model in there in between that 285 and 352. Uh, the heat exchanger here is full uh, as far as the burner operation. So when the burner uh, is heating up in this boiler and it's on, the combustion zone is the complete heat exchanger. Uh, but you notice that in the picture here, we have two separate heat exchangers. Uh, we've actually taken, instead of one continuous heat exchanger in this particular size of boiler, uh, we've taken that heat exchanger and cut it in half and basically uh, manufactured it with those heat exchangers in place uh, instead of one continuous. Uh, the sole reason for this really is just for pressure drop. So as far as the pump head requirements, you've got some commercial boilers here, commercial flow rates. This kind of keeps that pump head requirement down, uh, but it cuts it by about 50% in comparison to one continuous heat exchanger. So it allows us to use some smaller pumps uh, in uh, as far as the primary uh, pump in this uh, in these particular boilers, so that's the reason why we did that. Uh, same with the B2HA 399 to 530. So these two boilers really cross a line uh, as far as the the B2 input. So they kind of fall under some different code requirements. In some jurisdictions, you may need need another gas ticket to work on these particular boilers and get up on these uh, inputs. And the heat exchanger, again, uh, has multiple supply returns. The idea is to keep that flow, uh, that, that pump head re requirement to, to drop it down a little bit so we can use some smaller pumps here. Some other unique things on this particular boiler is instead of flow switches, you have flow sensors that kind of monitor the uh, flow rate in the heat exchanger, make sure everything's equal. 
And the gas valve is a little bit different on this boiler. It's got some extra functions. Uh, a low a gas pressure switch is included, as well as a valve proving uh, pressure switch as well. So there's some differences in this particular boiler, and we'll have a look at that gas valve. Uh, the nice thing is the gas valve for all the other boilers that we're talking about here in our current products uh, will be the same, with the exception of this particular uh, 3999 to 530. Uh, and then moving over to the CU3A, uh, a CU3 is kind of a, in my opinion, is more of a, like a throwback as far as a boiler goes. You're going to have to dust that dolly off uh, installing these particular boilers. Uh, pretty hefty boiler as far as size and capacity. The benefits there uh, is that uh, just like those uh, older atmospheric cast iron boilers, this is a high mass unit. And as far as high mass goes, uh, that really helps as far as issues with burner cycling, uh, piping arrangements will be very different on a high mass boiler versus a low mass boiler that we just kind of looked at. Uh, and as well as maintenance could be a little bit different. The heat exchanger is a bit different on this boiler. Uh, so it is a uh, has the benefits of that high mass, but also the benefits uh, uh, of the condensing uh, and modulating burner. So it's, it's kind of gives you the best of both worlds on the CU3A. Uh, it has uh, four sizes. So you will also see this possibly in some commercial applications we take you know, multiple CU3As and put those together. Uh, but those four models go from about 94,000 BTUs up to 199,000 BTUs of maximum input. And finally, also to mention here, even though we're not selling the WB2B Vito Dense 200 boiler, I think we stopped somewhere around 2013 or 2014, uh, these units will still have an impact as far as the EB and EE faults. And some of the information that we cover here uh, will ap directly apply to troubleshooting techniques on the WB2B line as well. So seven sizes in this particular boiler uh, went up to about 370,000 B2s of, of maximum input. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, those uh, units will also, uh, some of the stuff we talked about here today will also uh, apply directly to troubleshooting the EE and the EB faults on a the ordered video dense 200. Now looking at the controls on the bottom here just to kind of separate a little bit and give you a quick review on some of the things that you're going to be looking at. Obviously the screen on both units, this is where you're going to see the fault when it occurs. Uh, to the left you'll see the uh, little OptiLink port, the little the little, uh, little V on the left hand side. There's actually a communication port that uh, we can utilize but in this instance we're just going to use it as a reference point for the fault light which is the little red light there you see on the black control to your left. That same fault light is in the exact same position on the WB2B boiler as well. That little red light will flash when we have a fault. The green light will be on if there's power. Your reset button is to the left there, just, just to the left of your display screen on both controls. And then the power button, the on off button, is uh, on the very far right hand side. You can see it on the screen there on the white control as well as the black control to power the control, uh, cycle it on and off with that particular button. And then, of course, the navigation keys. The big difference there, obviously, is the uh, the newer style control. It's more of a text-based uh, control, so you use the uh, menu key and navigate through a menu. Whereas the WB2B, uh, a lot of the buttons essentially had specific purposes. So same sort of platform, just a little bit of a different interface between the two of those uh, units. So that's a little quick overview of the boilers that we uh, will encounter that might have that uh, these particular faults on them. So let's have a peek at what these faults are trying to tell us. Uh, the EE fault, you walk into a boiler room, you've got uh, you know, some of the boilers that we see down below here we just talked about. Uh, your screen will look like that on the face. So as soon as you walk in, you see the fault little triangle with a lightning bolt. It tells you to continue with OK. So you push the OK button and then the fault will appear. If you see EE fault, the control is trying to tell you that the burner uh, had a flame problem on ignition. So either the flame was missing or it was too weak. And it's going to give us some corrective actions there. We're going to review all of these different areas just to kind of get an idea of how we check these different uh, components to make sure they're not the issue. And important, uh, in our manual, uh, this is cut and pasted right from the manual on the right-hand side, you'll see the sequence of operation and where the EE fault can occur is in phase five. And what happens in phase five is the ignition uh, process. So at this point, the, we get uh, the gas valve opens, and we try to light that uh, we try to light that gas off or fuel air. 
the control is expecting a change in the ionization or your flame signal. If that doesn't occur or if it's not the expected signal that the control is looking for, it's going to give it another shot. It's going to try again and repeat that ignition process. Again, if that flame signal is not correct, it'll give it a third attempt. And if it doesn't uh, meet the right criteria as far as the flame signal, that's when you're going to see that EE fault. So important to understand that the E fault is a, a basically a, a ignition fault. So just like a, a, any other boiler, if the uh, ionization signal is not correct, that flame signal is not right, the unit's going to give us that uh, ignition fault, EE. Moving into EB, EB is a, a similar type of thing uh, as far as it, it has to do with the ignition process. Uh, boiler is fired, but we continually have a repeated flame loss during calibration. So this is a specific point that we're going to have a look at what is calibration here in a little bit. But basically, it's going to check some of the different components on the ignition side of the boiler. We're going to have a look at these different areas, talk about venting and flue gas recirculation, all those fun things as we move through. Uh, but again, you'll see that EB fault on the screen. And when that happens, it would be in phase six. So the burner is lit. Uh, boiler is operating and we're losing that flame signal. Uh, there needs to be a particular time initiation there in order to complete that calibration process. And this is where uh, the flame is dropping out before it's completed. Uh, it cycles uh, similar to an EE fault. It gives the opportunity for the burner to calibrate uh, a number of times. If it doesn't get that calibration cycle completed, that's when you start dealing with the EE fault as well. So those are your faults. Those are the boilers that we're going to be uh, dealing with those faults on. And it's important, obviously, now for us to understand uh, what our combustion management system is on these particular boilers that would give us these very specific faults as far as uh, the ignition process or calibration process. Uh, as far as the, uh, the boiler goes, so when we first fire up one of these units, uh, conceptually, what you see on the screen is exactly what is occurring inside of that boiler as far as the uh, logic. The boiler fires up for the first time and the unit is, the combustion manager is actually going to map a combustion curve. So it goes from fuel rich all the way to, to a lean combustion. All the while it's utilizing the ionization current to map that curve. So as the strength of flame signal changes, so is the fuel air ratio that the uh, the unit is dealing with there. And it's trying to dial the combustion into that optimum range there, just off of lambda one. Uh, lambda one is basically perfect combustion, so zero excess air. Uh, that is a theoretical type of situation. We all uh, know whether it's a uh, atmospheric all the way to premix, if there's some sort of excess air requirement there for safe operation. And that's what the burner is trying to locate uh, for us automatically. And in that, it basically, is, it's all done internally. So there's no adjustments for the gas fitter to make here. Uh, the boiler is working off of the color value of the fuel, uh, as well as the air, and creating that particular curve specific to uh, the operation function of the boiler at that particular point in time. As far as the ignition side of it, there really is no difference in the Lambda Pro. Uh, we use the ionization electrode, the flame signal here. It's a frame rectification system, which means we're giving the uh, control uh, sends an AC signal through the flame rod or ionization electrode. And we use the conductivity of the flame uh, to send that um, uh, AC signal uh, and through the flame, which is highly resistive. Uh, we end up, uh, the control is now looking through the burner head and down through the ground. It's going to be looking for some sort of microamp DC signal. So flame rectification, if you looked at the dictionary, what rectification means, it simply means uh, converting from an AC to a DC signal. So we're using a DC microamp uh, signal here or for flame safety, just like every other flame safety control uh, working off of rectification. The difference here uh, being is that that flame is now continually being monitored. Uh, so you see the arrows here kind of going um, back and feeding back to the control here. That is just to kind of amplify uh, when there's a change in the calorie value of the fuel, what the burner can actually do by adjusting the gas valve. But that information is always being fed back. 
So as the burner, after it does the calibration here and it finds that, that zone it wants to operate within, the parameters, it continually uses that point. So if there's any issues or changes, that ionization current signal changes, the burner wants to pull that uh, unit back into proper adjustment, and it'll do that by utilizing either um, typically the gas valve adjustment uh, to increase or decrease the gas throughput uh, to make sure that we are within that safe operating range. So no field adjustment for the contractor. There's no way for you to make any adjustments on low fire, high fire, and that's what a typical uh, you know, premix burner would be. We make an adjustment on low fire, we take the burn up to high fire, make the adjustment, and then there's a linear uh, relationship between every point in between that low fire and high fire adjustment that you just made. This particular unit is making that adjustment throughout the whole uh, combustion process to make sure that we have safe operation of the unit. So that ionization signal is not just used for proof of flame, but also a quality of that flame that we're dealing with at that particular point in time. So important things here to note, the differences and similarities between a conventional uh, flame rectification system and Lambda Pro. On the calibration side, what's happening here? So this is a picture, again, of a CO3A burner, actually, animation. So the burner had changed a bit here, but the exact same concept, the process is happening in the CO3A as it would be in a Vito Dens 200 information being fed back and adjustments are being made. So the calibration is an automatic alignment. So basically what we're looking for is we've got that information that we first started off with as far as how that burner fired and the burner wants to make sure that we calibrate back to that point at specific intervals. So as far as operation, you can see there the different intervals that we're going to uh, utilize uh, as we move through here. So we've got um, the default range, uh, when the burner calibrates, it's going to want to run the burner at a constant speed. That calibration process takes about a minute as it's going through there automatically. When is this going to happen? It depends on the type of cal calibration we're talking about. That first 100% calibration occurred when we first fired the burner up. From that point on, automatically, we're going to have a 20% calibration occur. Uh, so that basically will happen after every power up. So if you turn the burner off, you're doing a service or maintenance on it, and then you turn the burner back on or, or boiler back on again, it's going to do a calibration cycle when you power up the burner. If you have a fault, it's going to also, uh, re when you do hit the reset button, there's a calibration process that's going to happen there, again, that 20% calibration. Uh, and as the unit cycles, so every time it powers up on the 4th or 2nd, 4th, 8th, 16th, 32nd, 64th, 256th, and fire a 12th burner cycle. And if we don't uh, basically turn their power, the control off or down or have no power failures, it's going to basically just continually uh, do a calibration cycle about every 512th burner start. So that averages out probably to about every 100 hours at that point, depending on how many cycles you have per hour. There'd be about five cycles an hour uh, for that amount of runtime. The uh, the difference between 100% and 20% calibration is the 20% calibration is just added to uh, past values and basically to position that base value of that ionization signal again. So it just adds historic information and current information and based on that information, it's going to set that, that base value. 100% uh, calibration, just like when we first started the burner, there is no pre-existing information, it's going to essentially calibrate a new base value uh, for the uh, the burner control. And that calibration can be conducted manually. So as the burner operates in automatic fashion, it's continuously doing the 20% calibration. Uh, if we want to do 100% calibration, which sometimes is a valuable tool to, to know about, we can also uh, effectively do that as well. Uh, in a manual type of format. So we're going to show you how to do that here as we move through here, When you, if you hang uh, out with us here long enough. The areas that we want to have a look at, so just a quick overview here of the different areas, and we're going to go through these fairly methodically. Uh, for me, I like to kind of, my father was a technician from years ago. I kind of learned from him a little bit. You know, you look at the easiest stuff first, and then you start moving on to the more complex things. So it's kind of a systematic approach. And uh, that's how I'm going to do kind of kind of cover this format today is kind of look at the simpler things first, 
uh, a very wise uh, technician told me once to isolate and eliminate. So basically hone in on things, uh, check them out, and basically eliminate those from the troubleshooting process is not a problem. And that's often what modern troubleshooting is, isn't it? We basically take a, uh, a situation instead of trying to find out what the problem is, oftentimes we're taking and, 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 and throwing things out of the equation that we know the problem isn't by testing them and proving that those are safe as far as, uh, or correct as far as their operation. So we're gonna have a look at the gas delivery system. We're dealing with ignition faults, and obviously anything to do with the gas delivery is a problem, and whether it's pressure or uh, issues with the piping, delivery, contamination, whatever it might be. We're gonna go through some things that we found, uh, pictures to kind of back those things up as we look at the gas delivery system, but clearly we have to have a look at that, make sure there's no issues, there that are causing our uh, our faults. The gas valve uh, burner assembly and ignition system. So the ignition system itself, as well as the burner tube, so the one that's in the combustion zone that you don't actually see when you're standing in front of the boiler, all of that is part of the ignition system and needs to be inspected uh, and have a look at there. So whether there's loose connections there or we've got some issue with um, you know, fouling up or whatever it might be from operation, we have to inspect that and just make sure that there are no issues moving forward with the ignition system. We're gonna go through these different parts here and give you some base values to kind of look at and stuff as we move through. And then going through uh, after the ignition side, uh, the fire side, the heat exchanger, and of course the condensate kind of hand in hand there uh, on the combustion side of the boiler. As the unit is firing, obviously you're, you're uh, utilizing hydrocarbons here, so there will be some carbon deposits and things like that that need to be cleaned. Uh, and one of the great features of a Vito Dan's boiler is the fact that you have access to all of the openings that need to be serviced on these boilers. So there really is no reason not to service the units. Very simple to do. And we'll have a look at how to do that and do that effectively here as uh, throughout the hour as we move through here. But that certainly can cause some issues with flame stability if our heat exchangers fouled up. We'll look at that. And condensate flow. If there's some issue on the condensate side of your boiler, it's going to create a problem. Uh, during operation. So it can change things like pressures. You could have enough backup of condensate that you actually influence the combustion zone of the boiler. So it's important to have a look at that. And we'll kind of uh, take a peek at some, uh, you know, where those uh, condensate lines should be, where the P-traps are located and all that sort of stuff in the boiler. So you get a good handle on the condensate side of the unit. And that should be part of the whole servicing of the boiler to begin with is addressing the condensate side as well. So just taking a peek at that. Uh, from regular maintenance too, just to kind of add that to your list of things to, to check out as you're doing service or troubleshooting. Combustion air and venting. What we find with these two particular areas when it comes to faults, and it it's, doesn't matter what boiler you're dealing with really with the venting and combustion air, these really have a long-term impact over uh, your proper boiler operation. So as you install these systems, if something's not quite right on the venting or combustion air side, you might not see that show up right away. It may take a year or two years or three years or more sometimes for uh, the impact of improper venting or combustion air to become an issue. Uh, so we'll have a look at that, some things, signs to show you that there's some problem with your venting system or combustion air, uh, how to inspect those and, and kind of where to look to see if there's some problems and how to basically address those quickly before they become larger issues uh, with your, uh, your units that are out there. And on the, as far as the EE faults go, uh, electrical uh, and control side of the system as well. So field wiring uh, to the boiler can have an impact on your on uh, EE e and EB faults, uh, uh, wires and connections. We'll talk about you know how to check the wires and cables and stuff that make sure that things aren't loose. That's kind of a, in the manual, but also utilizing the control. We can use the control that's on the boiler to help us troubleshoot these things. Kind of like a screwdriver in your toolkit. Uh, the control is there for you to use to help troubleshoot these particular faults. So we're going to review some areas that we use uh, on the tech side uh, here to navigate through these controls to get a better understanding of how to use this when we're standing in front of it. So you get a really good comfort level uh, with our control uh, as a troubleshooting device as well. So I hope that we're going to cover this. Seems like a lot, but really uh, it really condenses down quite effectively here. So we'll, we'll, we'll move forward here and keep going on. So we, now that we saw the areas that we're gonna kind of hone in on here to troubleshoot, let's look at the different 
the tools that you may want to bring to the site as well. We got our our uh, heating technician here over to the left, uh, kind of scratching his head, wondering what other things you should bring to the site. Looks like he's loaded for bear here. He's got himself a circulator under his arm and his toolbox is all swagged out. Well, you know, obviously a heating technician with a burner on there and a, and a radiator. Uh, but what other tools you have uh, besides your typical screwdrivers and wrenches and stuff to access, we all should have those in our, uh, in our service vehicles. Uh, Torx uh, set of screwdrivers would also be a good idea. It's a lot of Torx fittings on our boilers for taking the burners off, etc. Uh, metric Allen keys, another uh, thing I like to have on. I'm going to show you how I use metric Allen keys to check the reference of the burner electrodes and the burner meshes and stuff like that as we move through here for service. Uh, but a multimeter on site, if you're troubleshooting an EE or EB fault and you give our uh, tech support line a call, uh, one of the things they're going to ask you for uh, would be things like voltages. You should be able to measure AC and DC voltage, uh, amperage, uh, continuity, resistance, those types of things uh, on with your meter. So that's very helpful uh, for troubleshooting the EE and the EB faults that we're talking about today. A combustion analyzer, we're dealing with combustion faults here. And having a combustion analyzer really gives you the uh, the eyes that you need for the troubleshooting combustion issues. You really can't make that out by looking at a flame, as we've all heard um, and understand. It's just not possible to look at a flame now and, and get a good idea if it's it's right or if we're way off. Uh, the combustion analysis will give us a really good information there. It also indicates if you've got flue gas recirculation by having a look at it, we can use the analyzer. Uh, to give us some sort of idea about a bunch of these other things, not just for the combustion itself and the, you know the get, getting an idea of the performance, but also for troubleshooting things like flue gas recirculation, negative pressures, and uh, et cetera. So the combustion analyzer is definitely a tool that we use to troubleshoot EE and EB. A manometer or a magnetic gauge, something to measure pressure. We're going to need to measure pressure in inches of water column, typically is what we have referenced in our manuals. And uh, we can use this also to measure things like vent pressure. So uh, in inches of water column, we're generally up to about 28 inches. Uh, we need to measure an inch or so of water column uh, for vent pressures and stuff like that. So you'll see my, uh, my manometer there in the picture uh, that I use for both of those tasks. And you'll see that in, in operation here shortly. And of course, uh, last but certainly not least is the service instructions. So you need the manual, the troubleshooting manual for the boiler that you're working with so that you know the different steps uh, and uh, have that information right in front of you. Uh, so there's really no questioning what uh, what you're supposed to be checking out here. The manuals always come with the boilers. So they're always available. Uh, they came with that unit that's hanging on the wall there that you're working on. Uh, they may have long uh, since gone somewhere else. Uh, the, there is a wiring schematic that's always part of the boiler cabinet. So if you take the door off or cabinet off of a boiler, uh, there's a little clear plastic envelope in there. And inside of that is a wiring schematic. So there's some information to help you uh, troubleshoot with your, uh, if you're doing some electrical uh, um, uh, measurings, et cetera. But uh, if you don't have a manual, you have the ability of getting those manuals remotely. So if you have a device that you can connect to Wi-Fi, you can simply go to our website. Uh, here in Canada, it's vsman.ca. Uh, we have a pro toolbox area in there and every piece of documentation that we've ever produced for our North American products would be located in there. You just have to know the model number of the boiler uh, and you'll be able to find the information that we're looking for to help you troubleshoot. Uh, as well, uh, a little bit more of an immediate thing is if you uh, have the Viesman Orange app on your device, you can click on there and you can get everything from the fault code checker to, to uh, basically put the input that fault right onto your uh, laptop or your your uh, your phone. And it's going to pop up with that fault information as well as a link to the service manual. So it's very simple to get that information uh, with these two different areas here. So I encourage you, if you don't have that, uh, that app on your phone, that is a very useful tool if you are dealing uh, with uh, Viesman as far as getting uh, information and access. So it just basically gives you a, essentially a, a Viesman uh, virtually right on your phone there. So instant access. So there's my pitch for the, uh, for the app. I think it's a great thing that we have. Ah, so now we're moving into the actual troubleshooting of the boiler. So thanks for hanging with me on that uh, little bit of information or kind of to, to build up to this particular point. 
Uh, and now we're going through, as I mentioned, some of the simplest things you can check. And these are not specific to these boilers. This is something that you would check with just about any unit that use is uh, flame rectification. And one of the primary things to first start out with, and I never overlook it, doesn't matter if that boiler's been installed, uh, just installed, or it's been installed for, you know, two or three years. And I've got proven examples, you know, of uh, going to different sites and people have been dealing with the EE faults and uh, the boiler's been installed for, you know, two plus years. And you, you put your meter on the, uh, and you, uh, on the uh, line voltage and you realize that the polarity is reversed and that's why they've been dealing with the EE fault. Uh, so that's basically how to check that out. Uh, we need to make sure that the power is brought into the boiler correctly. And I like to check it right at the 40 plug, right on the control console. So your power comes into these units uh, on the power pump module down, usually down below the boiler not on the 40 plug. There's also another green 40 plug in the control console. So you can tilt that control down, uh, pop the cover off and access this little green plug you see that's circled in green. Find the line, find the ground, and put your meter uh, from line to ground there, and that's where you should see your 120 volt. If this was a WB2B boiler and you looked at this particular spot, it would actually be 230 volts. So the voltages were different between those two generations. But speaking specifically of the current generation of boiler, uh, it would be, uh, that's just where you'd want to see 120 volt on the line to ground. If you measure from neutral to ground and you get the 120, 20 volt, then your polarity is reversed. That's probably the reason why you're standing in front of that boiler. Uh, reverse the polarity, you'll get the EE fault. And it's not a consistent fault. It'll be something that would happen where the boiler locked out today, uh, and then it was great for three days, then it locked out three times in that one day, and it, and it, and it carried on. It's basically just reversing the uh, AC voltage through the control impacts the rectification signal. So that flame signal will be very different with the polarity reverse. We want to make sure that's correct. Uh, and if it's correct, then you can just move on from there. We know it's not the polarity. We can also check the uh, ionization cable here as well. So just checking voltages. Uh, that voltage is there regardless if it's uh, uh, the power is polarity reversed or not. So it's not going to impact what you see here on AC voltage, but you'll get about 50 to 52 uh, volts AC on your ionization cable. Uh, to ground. So you just see my uh, alligator clip there, clip to the uh, burner ground, and then I've just measured uh, there, trying to do uh, multiple things with one hand there. It's a little funny uh, check of the of the power, but you see that we got about 51.6 AC volts on that cable. All right, so there's your polarity and how to check that. Uh, moving from there, we would just check the burner ground. Again, uh, flame rectification systems, the ground completes the circuit. Uh, from the ionization cable back to your control. And if the ground is not, uh, is problematic, then we're going to have a problem. You got to realize, understand, of course, we're talking about thousands, thousands of a microamp here, uh, DC. So any amount of resistance in ohms there uh, could really have an impact. We want to make sure we have a good signal here. And again, I'm back at the control console. Uh, this time, instead of measuring voltage, um, I have my uh, alloy clips here connected to the burner ground and I am going down to measure uh, the uh, connection at the ground on my 40 plug and I don't really want to see uh, a large resistance across that cable at that point in time so we see about uh, a 0.1 ohms of resistance here that's typical you might see zero ohms of resistance it might be just a closed circuit that's kind of what we're seeing ideally if you get up over a, an ohm or so of resistance here, that typically could become a problem uh, for that microamp DC signal, DC signal to be uh, to be true going back to the control unit. So uh, you want to basically make some uh, make some in, uh, investigating there to check those cables. Uh, likely there's a, a short some or an open cable somewhere, or we've got a loose connection there that's affecting our burner ground. So we'll have a look at that and move on from there if there's no issues with your burner ground. Uh, the next area to check, and like I say, this is trying to go from uh, the easiest stuff to check to the, the, the more, the more uh, complex stuff takes time. Uh, we always want to check gas pressure on our units. Really, you have no adjustments on your gas valve as we just kind of learned from looking at the Lambda Pro Combustion Manager. Uh, so we have to ensure that those voltages or those pressures are where we need them to be. And in the manual, again, just cut and paste it out of the manual. We give that information. 
Uh, there's differences between natural gas and propane. So depending on what type of boiler you're working with here, what the fuel is connected, uh, we want to uh, see the same maximum pressure or static pressure, uh, regardless of the of the fuel of about 14 inches. Uh, we also want to make sure that when we run the boiler uh, up to high fire and check that uh, gas pressure on high fire, that we don't drop down below four inches on natural gas, 10 inches on propane is the minimum. And then we can do a third check, which is lockup pressure. And I'll explain that here uh, in a moment and how we, how we would check that out. So first looking at uh, where to check that gas pressure, always uh, uh, an area that's, uh, that's questioned. We want to see it at the gas valve. Uh, so when you're talking to a, uh, a tech guy at uh, Viesman, tech person at Viesman, they are going to ask you to uh, hook your, your meter up to test the gas incoming pressure to the gas valve. And circled and highlighted in red is the test port. Little set screw in there, a little flathead set screw. You take that a turn, turn and a half back. You don't have to remove it completely, just a turn or so. Uh, put your uh, pressure gauge on there and then open up. Uh, your isolation valve and measure your static pressure. So there's the the uh, gas valve connected now to my mag my manometer, and our static pressure in our boiler room here at Beesman in Langley is about 13 and a quarter inches static, uh, which is acceptable. It's under 14 inches. Uh, if it was over 14 inches, I'd want to make some adjustments on my rig. Every time the burner fires and you're over gas pressure here, you're over firing the burner that's gonna be unstable as a flame, and you could end up with some EE faults, et cetera, just from over firing uh, the burner with a higher gas pressure than what we state in the manuals. If it's lower than uh, four inches, we have to make some adjustments there as well. We're not gonna get a flame. So checking that gas pressure static is an important starting point to making sure that the gas delivery system is not the problem uh, that's creating our fault and why we're there on that particular day. The other area that we want to look at, uh, folks, is the uh, adjusting the gas pressure for high fire operation. So a lot of times we check static pressure and uh, then the burner fires and we all oh, great, everything's good to go, but we really should check that at its highest input. And in order to do that, uh, there's some people will use the override button that's that we have on the control. Some people just turn the burner on and and uh, and uh, and uh, have a look to see if they can just check the gas pressure as it's firing. We actually have a test area on our controls on these new boilers, and you want to go into the actuator test area. It's in the manual. Now, if you don't know how to get there, you can always uh, give your uh, um, local Beesman uh, tech a call or uh, your local rep, and they can explain how to get into that uh, area of the control. Get into actuator test, and there's a full load area that we can get into, and now the boiler is going to fire up to its highest input. So we're manually controlling that, that operation of that burner, and we're going to put it into a high fire. And if it was natural gas, we can't drop below four inches. If it's propane, we can't get down below 10 inches. If there's any issues there on high fire, the, the problem could occur there where the burner lights, but then as we start modulating up, there's not enough gas for the amount of air, and we basically blow that flame out like a birthday candle. Uh, and uh, it will just continually repeat that process and kind of looking at an EB fault could be uh, caused by this because the burner goes through the, the cycle of operation. Now it's doing a calibration phase, it's ramping up, and then uh, we start locking out on, a, uh, on not enough gas pressure. So either one of these could really be caused by an issue with this, this problem, but we want to make sure that that gas pressure is stable and we are maintaining above the minimum, but below the maximum throughout the operating process of the, of the burners. And finally, on lockup pressure, uh, what we'll do here is when we're in that actuator test and the burner is firing up to high fire, we've got our, our gas pressure uh, sitting on our manometer. We're going to leave that manometer in place and we're just going to power the control off. So it's just physically turn the control off and that's going to stop the burner fan. And what we're looking for here is lockup pressure. How high does that pressure uh, go after the burner stops in operation? If it drops, if it goes above that 14 inches, again, we need to make some adjustments to our, our meter or to our appliance rig here so that we won't have those high lockup pressures uh, after the burner stops its operation. So a couple of things there to have a look at, uh, and those are how we would actually perform those different tests to prove the gas pressure is within the parameters that we are looking for uh, here at Viesman. 
if you're having a high lockup pressure, a lot of times that could be caused by the appliance rags being a bit too close to the uh, boiler itself. We want to see a rag usually about three feet on average for residential applications, sometimes a little bit longer for uh, commercial applications, depending on the, the size of the, uh, of the units that we're dealing with here. But that three feet uh, distance between the boiler and your appliance rag gives that regulator the ability of essentially basically uh, adjusting that pressure so it doesn't lock up so high. Uh, too close, and of course, every time the burner stops, we're going to be de dealing with that, that lockup problem. Some other areas here, just through a picture of uh, the gas bubble we see on the, the right-hand side where it was damaged by water. So if you're, if you, uh, as a uh, gas fitter, you're looking at that gas delivery system and you see some issues with the piping there, those really should be addressed and corrected uh, before moving on to anything else. Because if the gas delivery system is the weak link here, you really won't uh, be able to, to solve a lot of ignition faults. Doesn't matter what boiler you're you're working with here. It's just just proper to uh, make sure that uh, we're delivering the proper amount of gas uh, and with the proper proper delivery system here. And you'll see a picture in our manual. This is how we depict it, kind of the center picture in black and white. Not a pretty picture, but it, it kind of gives you an explanation. There is no appliance reg in sight here. So you see a proper drip leg. You see the piping. Uh, to the boiler itself, and that appliance rig is is uh, is upstream of the uh, schematic that we see here. So keep that uh, keep those regs uh, well upstream of your boiler, uh, not too far away that you create a large pressure drop, but far enough away that we don't have an issue with lockup pressure. Uh, we've also noticed copper can sometimes be an issue with your gas delivery systems, particularly on high pressure drops. You start off at a good static pressure, the burner goes to fire and you see some large pressure drops. Sometimes you go right down to zero on your on your uh, pressure gauge uh, if you have uh, copper piping in there. The reason being is that the sulfur and the copper uh, will well, basically don't mix very well together and the sulfur content in your natural gas can start to corrode the lining of the copper and you'll end up with these little black flakes uh, appearing in your filtering system you've got filters on your gas lines or if you open up your gas valves look at the mesh inside the gas valve you see little flakes of, uh, of little black flakes in there pretty a good indication that your copper is breaking down and over time, this will create uh, EE fault. So too high of a pressure drop, you drop down below that minimum, the burner's not gonna be able to light. You check static, everything looks good, you fire the burner, you, you end up with no flame. Uh, if you have copper there, always a good idea just to investigate it. And this picture here, that was just a very small piece of copper, probably installed for three or four years in this particular boiler. Uh, and after about three or four years is when the ignition fault started to occur as a result of the uh, copper connection here. So that was replaced with uh, stainless steel and we haven't had a problem since on this little boiler. So avoid the, uh, and not in all instances, but in certainly some that, that copper can be impacted. So have a look at it. We're just gonna review the gas valves here as well. Obviously part of the ignition system is the gas valves. And as I mentioned with the, uh, the new boilers, CU, whether it's a Vitacross 300, uh, B2TB, a B2HB or B2HA up to uh, 352,000 BTUs, that gas valve is the same part number. So very similar, a lot of similarities there. There's a different orifice depending on what size unit you're looking at. So obviously uh, same gas valve can be used on a B2TB125, but that B2HB160, that orifice will be a different size to allow more gas input uh, in there. There's two connections on these gas valves, doesn't matter what uh, what ones we're looking at. The 35 plug, and that will always be a gas valve connection on our Vespin system. We use a numbering system and coloring system on our connections here to kind of keep that, uh, you know, assist you in the field there to kind of remember what these connections are. Uh, if you are not, aren't sure where these connections are and what they do, if you pull them out and, and basically don't know where they're gonna go back in again, that, that happens. Uh, if that, if you look at that little wiring schematic that's that's inside of the boiler cabinet, uh, you look at that. It gives you a little legend there, so you can know where to put those connections back in again if you've if you kind of uh, lost your way. Uh, moving on here, uh, the 35 plug is power to the gas valve, so that opens up the valve stem and allows the gas to enter into the valve. Uh, 
the 190 plug to the right of it uh, is another signal used by the Lambda Pro combustion controller to meter out the amount of gas that we're looking for. So the gas valve opens on the 35 plug, Lambda Pro uses the 190 plug for that calibration cycle as well as adjusting the gas input for proper flame and, and fuel area or flame signal uh, back to the control. Just a little note there, not a very good picture. Uh, apologize, didn't have a chance to focus the camera obviously on this one. Uh, but you see the top of that valve, it gives you the information uh, as far as, you know, some good information on maximum temperatures and things like that, but also it gives you the voltage that we're looking for here. And just like your uh, combustion flame signal, which is a rectified signal, so too is the voltages uh, to the uh, gas valve as well. Uh, it's a rectified, uh, basically DC signal that we're that we're uh, getting uh, to open up that gas valve. So let's have a peek at what that's all about. Uh, first thing we want to check is resistance on these different connections. And uh, I put some reference numbers here, and I don't want this to become basically written in stone that you must have 75 ohms of resistance on a small gas valve, or you need to replace the gas valve. These are just benchmark areas to have a look at, reference points. As you use the gas valves and their operation from a brand new gas valve, the one that's been, you know, just, just ran for a domestic hot water cycle or something like that, that resistance is gonna change. Generally speaking, you're gonna get an increase in resistance as the gas valve gets a little bit warmer. So these are literally just um, uh, kind of some benchmarks for you to kind of reference as you're kind of doing your troubleshooting. Uh, what we're really more looking for here in my opinion, is a high resistance. It's something that tells us that the, the, there's an issue with the gas valve because the valve coil has been impacted, uh, an open circuit or a shorted circuit, something like that. Uh, the 35 plug here, when you take the 35 plug out, I don't have a picture of it here, but when you remove it, there's actually three poles on the plug. There are the two line connections on DC around the outside and there's a ground in the middle. So checking resistance on the coil, you take your meter across the two outside poles and measure what we're looking for there. So you'll see that uh, I've measured the 35 plug here on the right-hand side and the large gas valve is about 0.6 K ohm. So we're using thousands of ohms here. A small gas valve uh, has the resistance on there as well. And then on the 190 plug, the resistance is a little bit lower, significantly lower, but uh, those are the numbers there. About 20 ohms, a larger gas valve, and you measure across the 190 plug. It only has two poles in 190, so you just measure across the two poles. And the uh, smaller gas valve, about 75 ohms. So if you uh, measure across there and your meter basically doesn't change, your infinite resistance there, that gives us a good indication that you're probably dealing with an EE fault at that point. And that's why you're sitting in front of that boiler, that, that gas valve resistance, uh, the, 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 the valve stem itself, is the, the valve coil itself is the issue. So replacement of the gas valve would be the re recommendation here. And then measuring voltage. As I mentioned on the top of the gas valve, it tells you what the voltage is going to be here. Uh, be careful on a WB2B, uh, the voltage is, uh, remember is a, it's instead of a 120 volt AC, power, it's stepped up through the pump module in a WB2B boiler to 230 volts. So the, the gas valve power will be different as well between the older generation of 200s and the newer generation. Uh, I've uh, took the cover off of the control console and tilted it down and you can see my meter is just checking the test porch right on the top of the plug coming off the control console. You could also just unplug the uh, connection at the gas valve and stick your uh, leads into the gas valve uh, 35 plug and then have the boiler trial for ignition and measure the voltage there in DC. So set your meter to DC uh, volts and then have the boiler go through a trial of ignition. And we wanna see about 106 volts DC on the, uh, the current gas valves on the B2HA, uh, B2TB boilers that we have uh, out there uh, currently. Uh, as far as the uh, 190 plug, that's going to modulate based on the burner input. So as the burner is modulating from low hot fire to high fire, an ignition point will be different from low fire. Uh, the uh, DC signal you're going to get from there, you can just measure right across the, the 190 plug uh, without taking it apart or, or removing it, measure it across. 
And those are kind of, again, benchmark numbers. So if you measure high fire and your boiler is only getting four and a half volts DC, it's probably because it's a smaller unit. And of course, the, uh, the impact there is going to be, that DC volt is going to be a little bit lower. Uh, so, th But this is the range that we're looking for here. Again, it's more about measuring, and I don't see a voltage there. Uh, we might have a problem uh, as far as operation there. But uh, just good reference points for you to kind of make a note of uh, where you used to see that 190 plug voltage going to. All right, uh, and of course, uh, kind of getting back to Lambda Pro here a little bit, uh, we have the uh, burner here, you see it firing up, you see the flame rod, you see the uh, ignition electrodes there as well on that burner just above that little, um, little graph. And uh, we see these electrodes here, so that's where our primary flame rod is, or ionization signal. Right in behind it, you see the burner ground kind of uh, plugged into it, you see the ground coming from the um, ignition transform there and, and plugging into the, the uh, bottom of the uh, burner chassis. The ignition electrode is also uh, uh, just above, kind of at usually about the uh, nine o'clock position on our boilers. And the new style ignition transformer, and this is a different style of system than was on the, cur the uh, previous uh, generation of WB2B. Uh, we changed the uh, to a version two a Lambda Pro system, and the difference being primarily is this ignition transformer and the ignition electrode. Uh, now we have a second reference point that Lambda Pro uses. It uses the um, ignition electrode as well as the primary uh, flame rod here to measure that ionization current. The reason for that is you can have a dip in your ionization signal, and I've seen this in uh, some of our controls, more commercial controls. We can actually look at the watch your burner uh, flame signal as the boiler fires. And uh, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, kind of anomaly where the, when the burner fires, that flame signal jumps up and then it sometimes will drop down as the electrode is heating up and then gradually start to move up again. If, the, if it takes too long for that electrode because of age or conductivity to not get above that valley again, that little dip, then the burner usually locks out on those flame faults, and it's just really just about that igniter uh, basically being a little bit uh, a little bit worn and not having the proper signal. Uh, this way here, because we have two electrodes referencing, uh, the control uses the strongest of the two uh, to get us past that little uh, ionization dip or little valley uh, for more reliable operation of your control. So we use both of those, and that's a kind of a key point when we're talking about flame signal feedback. Both of those are going back to our unit uh, and giving us a flame signal. This picture here should give us a pretty good idea. As you see this, the, the CU3A burner firing up here, you look at the electrodes, which ones are heating up here faster. Uh, because the, uh, the ignition electrode is a little bit closer, you'll see it glow red a bit quicker. So it heats up faster, that signal's a little bit stronger. But as the burner's in operation, the ionization, because of its size and reference, uh, will start to take over the majority there. It is possible for you to actually monitor the flame signal. Uh, you don't have to use your microamp meter and put it in series with your ionization cable. Uh, you can go to coding level two here and look for address 42. In coding level two, uh, address 42 is the actual reference of the flame signal. So we have about 8.6 microamps DC on our control here. We don't typically use that number, even though I think it's kind of odd that we don't we use the flame signal here for troubleshooting. We actually go to address 48. The reason being is after the burner stops firing, 42 is going to go to some random number, 355, 255. It's not going to be usable. But if you have a lockout on an EE fault and you reference address 48 and it's down below 9, uh, that's a good indication that it's a ionization electrode fault. So address 48 is a nice reference here to make sure uh, it stays above 10. Uh, you might be there troubleshooting that fault because the ionization quality uh, is an issue uh, because we have electrodes that aren't even feeding back the correct signal. So the flame signal quality is at address 48, and that stays there based on the last reference fire, uh, fire of the burner. If you power it off and power it back on again, that 48 is going to go to some random number. So don't turn the control off. Just quickly go, if you have an EE fault on the control, 
uh, you can go to code level two right away at that point, have a look at address 48 and make a reference of what that number is there. All right. Uh, to check your electrodes, you can do a quick uh, little check here, which I have done. Uh, if you have your torque screwdrivers I mentioned, you can access your uh, flame rod, your ignition uh, electrodes right from the face of the burner without pulling the burner out. And having a look at, uh, you know, is there cracks in the porcelain? Is there some problem there? What the condition of the electrode is? Is it all warped? Is it, uh, is it fouled up to a point where it, the conductivity is affected? Uh, really simple to take your uh, meter and put it on continuity. So guys that understand what continuity on the meter is, you put the two leads together and you get the beep. Uh, if you take your electrode out and put your meter just across the electrode, you should hear a beep. It's a, con a conductive material. If it's fouled up to the point where it's going to be a problem, you'll start actually not getting a beep on your electrode. So they would need to have some attention there to make sure that you have good conductive uh, area on those electrodes. So it's an easy test there to check for continuity across your electrodes. And just uh, basically be aware uh, when you remove these electrodes that they are uh, gasketed, which means there's a little graphite gasket in between the electrode and the burner chassis. So when you take these out, uh, we, we need to make sure that those uh, gaskets stay in good form. If they crack or split, they need to be replaced. Uh, we do sell these as a package. You can just buy the um, those little graphite uh, gaskets for the different igniters if you're in that uh, in that situation. Some guys will just buy the electrodes and replace them automatically as, as just part of the uh, part, part of the service. But you can just inspect. Uh, and, but I just want to kind of make you aware that there's a gasket there. And, uh, and uh, if you disturb it there, potentially you could end up with something you need to replace uh, as far as the gasket. Not, doesn't happen often, but I don't want uh, basically to do that and, and then have a, a surprise at the end there where there's a the gasket has to be replaced. Just be aware of that. A more thorough investigation would be to remove the burner at this point. And now you can reference the burner uh, mesh to the electrodes themselves. And all of the VitoDens 200 B series boilers, B2TB, all the way up to the B2HA530, uh, have the exact same reference points. The igniters and electrodes might look a little bit different, but the measurements and the gaps between the mesh and the electrodes are the same. This is where I use my Allen keys, so metric Allen keys, uh, little hex keys here. And if I'm measuring six millimeters off the burner mesh for my uh, spark electrode, my ignition electrode, I can take that six millimeter Allen key and just slide it between the mesh and the electrodes. Uh, you got about a positive two millimeter um, difference there. So basically there's some tolerance there between six and eight millimeters. But this you are just a really easy way of just checking and referencing those gaps. Uh, if there's an issue here with gaps, and just a kind of a warning, uh, if those igniters and flame rods haven't been changed in a number of years, they become brittle. They get that nice gray coating on them, which needs to be uh, this needs to be removed to get proper conductivity. But as they get older and uh, in the fire more, they get brittle. And if that uh, igniter or flame rod is warped and you're trying to put that back into spec and you take your pair of pliers and start to bend that, tip you end up with two pieces of electrode there. So now instead of one electrode, you have two. Uh, doesn't really help your situation. You're gonna have to replace that, uh, that component. And that's usually going to happen on a 4.30 on a Friday afternoon. We all know that. And uh, there is a method, uh, some very experienced uh, gas fitters told me, by no means did I come up with this on my own. Uh, they, they'll take a torch and they'll hit those electrodes uh, with a torch and heat them up. So when they glow red now, you can actually bend them back more into a spec. And then you want to give them a good uh, sanding down there to make sure that those electrodes are, are basically conductive. Uh, and make a note that you want to come back and replace those electrodes in short order because uh, they are going to probably lock out eventually on some sort of fault there. Uh, be proactive and, and get in there and replace those. And this is just a reference for the CU3A, so a little bit of a different look to them. Uh, for guys that uh, remember the WB2A boiler, Vito Dance 200 boiler from years ago, we made up to 2009. And there are still a number of those boilers out there. They're getting up to about 20 years old now. So those low mass boilers uh, in the you know 15 to 20 year old range, those boilers had a very similar um, burner uh, to them, this, this dome style uh, burner on them. But there's the reference, just kind of a little 
point in history there, walk down memory lane for you. Uh, but uh, yeah, so we've had this dome burner before and we brought it back with the CU3A because of the style of heat exchanger it has. It's very uh, complementary to the, the, the type of heat exchanger we have in the CU3A burner or boiler, sorry. And finally, cleaning of the boiler. We all understand and kind of know what clean and dirty looks like. So you go from left, there's a brand new heat exchanger. You kind of understand that's a clean heat exchanger. If we open up a, a boiler after, looks one here, looks like it's about five plus years of operation, unless there's been a lot of flue gas recirculation. Uh, but after a number of years of operation here, we understand that that is a dirty boiler, right? We need to clean it, get that debris out probably replace a few components there that refractory because it got hit with some uh, water in the back there. You can see some dried calcium deposits on it, et cetera. Uh, but what about something like this? Looks like a pretty clean boiler, obviously been fired. You can see an operation there. Uh, the deposits have been all cleaned out and it looks nice and clean. But what we are looking for here, if you look on the right-hand side, uh, the picture of a Wiesmann Vitodens heat exchanger actually in operation. So the burner is firing here and the boiler is, flue gas is moving through it and you've got condensate forming on the surface of the heat exchanger. Those gaps are very important to uh, the boiler proper operation. So if those start getting fouled up over time and we don't address those gaps, then we're gonna start dealing with problems with pressure drop through the heat exchanger and flame instability, et cetera. Uh, and, Vsman has a cleaning tool you see over on the left hand side. It's available. You can give your uh, Vsman reps a call. They have those, uh, they can uh, get you access to those. Uh, I think we have a number of wholesalers that might be attending this uh, seminar today. Uh, just jot that part number down. That's going to really be helpful when those uh, guys that are cleaning Vsman boilers are, are looking um, for that part number. You'll have it available for them there. Um, that could become an A item for some of you wholesalers. Uh, this. Uh, seven eight five eight four nine two and that's going to clean these gaps out and that is going to go a long way to making sure we have a really clean combustion area here and a nice stable area for that flame uh, to modulate from ignition down to low fire up to high fire and all those points in between so proper cleaning and maintenance uh, is another area that we want to have a look at here so if we walk into a boiler that's really dirty hasn't been cleaned in a number of years obviously uh, you're probably there uh, dealing with that fault as a result of that lack of maintenance. And we can check some of that uh, information here as well. Uh, if you have a look at the boiler uh, uh, top here, this is actually B2TB in our boiler room, and uh, there is my uh, manometer. And we can check and measure vent pressure here. And this is kind of similar to the gas valve resistance. There's no set value here that that uh, we use as a baseline. Uh, each size boiler might have a different, the heat exchanges are a bit different, the pressure drops are a bit different through each boiler. But what we're uh, looking at here is uh, to give you some idea of some mins and maxes. So as the burner uh, fires up, if the heat exchanger here, and I'll throw that, uh, that um, my manometer into the test port of the boiler here. So we're on the fire side here. So this is where we'd also do combustion analysis would be on the right test port plug on our uh, our boilers. Here I'm just measuring vent pressure with a, uh, my little contraption I made up uh, to measure uh, that vent pressure. Uh, so I measure here. If I am looking at the boiler in operation, uh, as the boiler lights off, there'll be a particular pressure I'd be looking for here. As it ramps up to high fire, that pressure is going to increase. Down to low fire, it's going to decrease. Generally speaking, as I've been uh, testing this and going through the uh, operation of years, usually when you get up to vent pressures that are up around 0.9 uh, plus on this side, a really good indication that you might have some restrictions on the venting itself. So there's not really a problem in the combustion area, at least that's not picking it up an issue, uh, but it's basically saying that when the burner uh, fires and that fan is pushing against something that's very restrictive in the vent. So that would uh, basically create a high uh, inches of water column reading on your manometer. If we had a, an issue on the heat exchanger side, as the fan was pushing against that uh, heat exchanger now and through those gaps and they're all plugged up, your reading would be significantly lower than it would would uh, than it should be. So basically, what we're looking for here are some parameters 
uh, as far as the operation from from that uh, low to uh, to high, uh, and uh, and uh, just a really good test to have a look at uh, if there's some problem with your boiler here. Uh, sometimes it's difficult just to say what's the vent pressure like, and the guy and you say it's good because we good is really not a really uh, an acceptable number. We need to really check it out to see what we got going on there as far as operation. Uh, so we can measure that and have a look at it. Sometimes if you can see the P-trap, you can get a good idea of uh, problems in your vent system as well. If the water is displaced, uh, it, displacing in the P-trap, sometimes it even actually evacuates the P-trap completely so the water completely goes out. The flue gas is actually finding it easier to move through the P-trap than it is to actually exit the vent. Uh, you could have that particular um, uh, issue with a restricted vent as well. So there's just a few things there. If you don't have a manometer, uh, maybe you can have a look. In extreme case, you might see something on the condensate side that indicates you've got a problem with the blockage in your venting system. Uh, so your condensate pipes are shown here. Uh, we've got a picture of the CU3 in the top right, uh, one of our Beta 200s on the uh, top left here. And those pipes on the condensate side are as direct as possible. There are already P-traps in these boilers. We don't need a second or third or fourth P-trap in the piping itself. Uh, we sell you basically what comes with the boiler is about six feet of this gray pipe. Uh, you don't have to use all of it. You can cut some of that off. Uh, just because you paid for it, you can still cut it off there and uh, use the appropriate amount to get that gray pipe as direct as possible. Uh, you'll see the uh, there's a couple of different types of P-traps in the Vito Dens boilers, depending on the sizes that we're looking at. They all do the same function, and they all indicate we don't need a P-trap external to the, the uh, condensate pipe. Uh, what we don't want to see is what's down below. Similar to that, where we've got a lot of excess um, condensate uh, piping there, and that's just going to create possible airlocks, slowly dra slow draining of the condensate, and in some extreme cases, the condensate will actually back right up into the heat exchanger. Uh, so we want to address this and make sure that those pipes are as direct as possible uh, so we get proper drainage of the condensate. All right, so we'll cut that pipe off there and straighten that out and make sure that's in good shape. On the, uh, as far as the combustion side of the boiler, so here's my combustion analyzer uh, that we use here at uh, in Wiesman. And uh, I would reference the manual. Again, it's important to know what we're looking for here. Uh, and uh, if we're doing a combustion analysis on a, on a uh, natural gas, Vito Dens boiler, for instance, that the CO2 number range is about seven and a half to 10 and a half, uh, nine, and a, nine to 11.3 uh, for propane. Uh, and of course, the O2 numbers there are different ranges. Now, depending on what you like to reference there, uh, those numbers are available for you. If you're doing a test here, uh, it is possible for you to also force a calibration. So if we're looking at these numbers and those numbers aren't lining up with what we're looking for uh, and we want to basically uh, change the parameters here a little bit and change that baseline, uh, we can do that 100% forced calibration. And this is how we would actually com complete this particular um, operation or function. Uh, we would need to get into coding level two so you'll see on the right-hand side, coin level two, the first address we go to is the address 11. And for guys that have uh, converted our boilers from natural gas to propane, they'll be familiar with address 11. That is the address that opens up the combustion uh, controller programming. So once I uh, change this address and push OK, and now that it's reading a value of, of nine, it may go back to zero. Don't be concerned about that. Uh, but what you will see uh, a little key will show up on the control screen as well as the green light will start to flash to the left of your display here. So you'll see that little green light that usually indicates power is flashing. Once you set this address up to a value of nine, you're then going to go to address 85. And you see a little key up in the right-hand corner of the display there on the, uh, on the unit. And we'll take that address 85, uh, push the OK button and change it from zero to one and push OK. And that's going to start a combustion calibration cycle. Oops, sorry. And that's going to basically take about a minute. What's going to happen here, uh, avoid putting your analyzer, combustion analyzer, in the flue gas as the burner is doing a calibration cycle. The red and green lights are going to flash intermittently here as it's doing this. It takes about a minute. And during that process, the CO can be fairly high. 
and that could start to impact your um, combustion analyzer as far as having it back to sending it back to get it calibrated etc so keep it out of that uh, flue gas while it's doing the calibration once the green light is flashing what you can do now is go back and reset these addresses 85 goes back to zero and you have to go back to address 11 and just push OK and OK uh, and it basically resets it back to zero. That gets you out of this, this calibration uh, function and at that point in time you can go back to your uh, boiler actuator test and go from base load to full load or wherever you want to go and check that um, the, the numbers there again and you'll see that there will be some improvement there. You've now replaced the 20% calibration uh, impact with a full uh, update of the baseline for your, your flame signal uh, by doing this. So this is a pretty effective method of resetting that, uh, that calibration um, while you're staying in, in front of the boiler. The venting, as I mentioned uh, previously, and you had a little sneak peek there as I went ahead of myself a bit, but the, uh, the venting, uh, as well, as I mentioned, it has a really long-term impact on your boilers. We come to see that and realize that as manufacturers, as we go to sites with issues, uh, that, that uh, the venting and the combustion air side of the boiler has a fairly long-term impact, as you would expect. Uh, the first venting layouts we supported here, you can see that both boilers, the CU3As as well as the VitoDens units can use coaxial venting. It's a native venting for Vito dens, the adapter on the top of the boiler is a concentric fitting to adapt directly onto your uh, coaxial vent, where the CU3As, they're naturally a two-pipe vent system. The exhaust and combustion are separated, and we have a transition adapter to put us back to a coaxial type of a system there if you want to use coaxial venting on those. Remember grades, make sure that we're pitching back towards the boiler. We want the condensate to drain out of the uh, P-traps and, and, and basically into your uh, neutralization units, et cetera, to, to neutralize the condensate this way instead of having it going through the outside and, and possibly damaging the, uh, you know, below the venting system with, uh, you know, grass or whatever. Uh, be aware that the uh, units with coaxial venting, when you get into the larger boilers, there should be a transition adapter that changes the diameter of the uh, um, transitions from the top of the boiler vent exhaust to the actual venting diameter. Uh, if you, there's no transition here, there will be some flue gas recirculation occurring at that point, and that will cause fouling of your heat exchangers prematurely, damaging of components, as well as the EB and EE faults can occur uh, because of that flue gas recirculation. So a good check there is just to verify with the combustion anal analysis that there is no uh, issue there with contamination. There is a uh, leak test that we can actually do uh, with coaxial venting on our boilers. Uh, this, the VitoDens specifically, if you take your analyzer, combustion analyzer, and put it in the left test port and fire the boiler, if there is any issue there with flue gas recirculation, whether the transition adapter is missing or one of the gaskets in the vent system here is pinched or, or uh, displaced, the, C, the O2 number on your analyzer is gonna start to change. So typically it starts at about 21%, 20.9%. If it drops down below 20.6, that's measurably enough uh, CO2 is entering into your vent that you've got significant flue gas recirculation. A good indication that you've got some something uh, occurring inside your vent system here that's causing that exhaust to get back into the combustion air and impact the amount of oxygen your burner's gonna have uh, for fuel here. So we wanna have a look at that if there's a problem. Uh, two pipe systems, we have three different styles of two pipe systems that Wiesman supports and you can see them all here, whether they're a Vito Pro, uh, sorry, a Vito Cross 300, sorry, or a Vito Dens. With two pipe, depending on the size, you might need a parallel pipe adapter for the Vito Dens. Uh, naturally off of the CU3As, you've got two pipe coming off of there. Uh, again, the pitch for your exhaust venting, we want to maintain those uh, pitches towards the boiler. Um, but you'll see both terminations are could be horizontally terminated, so sidewall vented. You can see vertically vented boilers here. Uh, you can see that on both units. And there's also the hybrid system where you see a vertical pipe, the exhaust is, is, is penetrating through the roof, and the combustion air is coming through the sidewall of the building. So these three styles of venting are supported. What is not supported would be a hybrid system where the 
exhaust is horizontal and the combustion air is vertical. Uh, if you've ever uh, taken a pipe and, and uh, inserted it, or basically if you ever uh, take a draft reading on a chimney, you'll understand that that vertical pipe always has some sort of draft in it. Different pressures, different temperatures create a draft or draw. And if the exhaust is vertical and the combustion air is horizontal, as we had saw previously, when the boiler, after the boiler fires, there will be a small amount of draft created and we'll just pull uh, combustion air, fresh combustion air through the boiler and it'll exhaust out um, through the vent uh, termination at the top of the roof. When you have a system that's set up like this, now instead of uh, the exhaust uh, basically creating draft, it's now the combustion air pipe that creates the draft. So after the boiler stops firing, uh, the uh, combustion air pipe or duct here is going to have a reversal of flow, so a little bit of a, of a draw of draft from the boiler on up through the roof and that's going to pull any residual flue gas back through that exhaust pipe and that's going to end up through your uh, going through your boiler and some evidence of that uh, can be uh, utilized by looking at the pictures you see here now on the right so damaged components uh, these components that you see this is a venturi uh, damage because it was impacted by uh, this type of a, a system. Oftentimes you might see, if it's an older system, you might see a whole graveyard of venturis and stuff like that kind of sitting in the corner of these boiler rooms, uh, indicating that they're basically, we, we see the issue, we replace the component, we actually don't uh, solve the source of the problem. Uh, you can also see some uh, corrosion on the side of the boiler in extreme cases where as that, uh, as that uh, exhaust gas moves through the boiler, it comes out through the venturi pipe, hits the side of the boiler enclosure and then goes up through the combustion air piping and out. Uh, but any of this evidence of uh, is uh, basically good evidence that you've got flue gas uh, coming into the combustion air side of the boiler. And these components are not built to handle flue gas. So they will deteriorate over time and cause those particular problems. So if you have discovered that this is the type of configuration on your venting, we need to address that uh, as the source of the problem Otherwise, we'll continue to just replace parts on these units until that uh, venting system is uh, connected and fixed. The other area we look at here, of course, uh, coaxial two-pipe systems. We also have uh, single-pipe systems, or what we call room-dependent air systems, uh, where we're taking uh, basically the vent to the outside, whether it's vertical or horizontal, and we're uh, cutting a hole in the wall here somewhere to bring in a passive fresh air into the uh, boiler room. So it's not directly connected to the boiler as you see uh, as the boiler operates. Uh, the technician here uses a code book to size that particular opening appropriately for all the gas appliances in that boiler room so that we don't starve any particular uh, unit from getting appropriate amount of combustion air for operation. And once we size that uh, and operate here we see that uh, everything is working quite well. The issue with this is now that your boiler is a single pipe and you have a hole in the wall, the uh, boiler breathes as the building is going to breathe. So if there's some issue with negative pressure, an inner manual, never have a boiler installed under negative pressure. It would be with which every boiler manufacturer would be on board with that particular uh, statement. And the reason being is that it, once the boiler fires, if there is a residual flue gas in there and you have negative pressure in the building, that exhaust duct is now a ventilation duct for your building. So what's gonna happen is it's gonna reverse flow and we're gonna actually pull any residual flue gas back through the boiler. Very similar um, issue with the venting configuration we just looked at uh, previously with the incorrect hybrid system installed. Uh, you'll see evidence uh, sometimes of staining on the side of the boilers. Uh, definitely areas in, in the fans where combustion air should be, no, no uh, flue gas should be in these areas, but you see that kind of the gray pitting of the uh, fans here. Good indication that flue gas is getting back into the boiler uh, as combustion air, and that's going to be a problem uh, moving forward. So just really good areas to investigate. If you see these in your boiler rooms, these are red flags for you. They're not naturally occurring phenomenon. This is a problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, otherwise, you continue to re replace or repair the parts, and uh, then those parts get damaged again, and you're just in that, that vicious cycle of, of replace and, uh, and replace. So have a look at that. A pretty simple test usually is just to start the burner, have all the exhaust uh, you know, uh, fans or whatever in the building turned on, and shut the boiler off, and then put your hand up against the Venturi. If you start feeling 
that combustion air uh, basically reversing, you start feeling some hot, damp air coming back through the venturi, that's a pretty good indication that you've got some uh, issue there with negative pressure. Uh, just as an aside here, the newer VitoDense 200 boilers, all of them have this little membrane uh, flapper. This has been in, uh, used uh, with Wiesmann's common vent systems in Europe since about 2007. So we're not new to common venting systems. Uh, we've had this added in uh, to our uh, B-series boilers because all those units can be common vented as well in commercial applications with so single vent uh, multiple boilers. Uh, there's some rules about that, uh, really not time to talk about that in this uh, seminar, but the uh, idea here is that uh, that flapper actually uh, mitigates a lot of that negative pressure issue on these particular boilers, just to let you know, uh, but a good area for you to inspect as you're inspecting your boilers is the condition of that uh, particular flapper uh, right there, and that's pointed out in the service manual. Uh, some other things here to look at for flue gas recirculation, some pictures. You see the refractor in the middle here, Very uh, a lot of calcium deposits in the hair, a lot more than would typically occur if the condensate was just backing up. Uh, and that's a really good indication that that combustion air is, is very uh, damp uh, and uh, we're dealing with a problem with uh, flue gas entering into the boiler. I always like to look at the outside of the heat exchanger, so top left-hand corner you see that streaking and staining on the outside of the heat exchanger. Any signs of that, really good indication we got flue gas getting into the boiler. And then on the top of the unit, top right, you see the corrosion stains here. That's a displaced gasket, most likely on the vent, uh, creating the problem where we see the stain on the top of the unit. And again, any of the accessories where you see water staining on the gas valves or you know damage in the fans, all good indication that we've got some flue gas recirculation or flue gas is at least getting into the boiler uh, and, and causing those particular issues. So if our vent's not straight, for instance, we could have a problem because that puts a strain on the gasket. There is some tolerance here, but if it's not uh, if it's not installed correctly, the gaskets here get displaced, and that's going to be an ongoing problem. Uh, we need to correct the venting issue there. Uh, combustion air and exhaust too close together. Uh, I mean, investigation. If you do a combustion analysis and you start seeing those O2 numbers really low, this is a really good area to investigate. Uh, even in uh, two pipe systems here where you've got the correct amount of distance according to the manual, those are all minimums and they don't take into consideration that you are on the prevailing wind side of the of the building. Uh, and even if you have the, you know, the, the absolute minimum criteria that we give you in the manual, if that wind starts blowing the right direction, it can cause uh, flue gas recirculation here. So even if you say, yeah, the, the vents are the correct distance apart, shouldn't be a problem. If they're on that side of the building, you may have to build up some sort of a fencing uh, to basically mitigate the uh, the prevailing winds from having that particular impact. And of course, in colder climates, makes me cold just looking at this particular picture. Uh, you could have buildups of ice, uh, frost in your in your exhaust systems and combustion air systems here. So obviously, obviously, depending on the temperature, uh, this could be the problem as well. So any type of restriction here, whether it's major, these are kind of really major looking uh, issues, uh, then we want to uh, mitigate that. Uh, shout out to George, uh, who sent me some of these pictures here. Uh, I added them in there, really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, moving forward, like I say, if you guys have some photos and stuff to kind of look at this, Mark and I really enjoy uh, going through these pictures because they really paint the picture for people that that uh, that that really need this information. So uh, thanks to the guys that have, have given us some of these pictures. Uh, EE and EB faults as well on the combustion air side of the boiler. So once you identify that, we still need to make sure that we clean up this debris. Uh, and you'll see like fans get fouled up. That's going to impact uh, static pressure. If the burner tubes get built, uh, get fouled up there, they're going to increase the pressure drop. You're going to have some problems on that side as well. So if you have uh, areas of, with, where you get a lot of combustion, combustion air contamination, uh, just like your vacuum cleaner, that's what your boiler is when it's in operation. For every cubic foot of gas, we're probably pulling in 13 cubic feet or so of, of air as well. So 13 times more air than gas. Going into the boiler, you can get an understanding very quickly of why that debris can accumulate so quickly. So have a look uh, and investigate. And if you've got a lot of fouling here, we need to clean that up very thoroughly. Clean the burner meshes all the way back to the venturis uh, and the cabinets, et cetera, to make sure that there's no issue uh, with fouling of our components. And this has been, uh, before I even started working with Wiesman, I remember this particular slide. Um, 
and uh, basically just storing of the wrong types of materials that off gas can have a problem with your system as well. So we'll have a quick review of this. We're getting a little late in time. We're just going to want to move on. I really appreciate you guys hanging in there. I know I'm way past what I said. Uh, this is the last slide, and this is more related to the EV fault. Uh, as the boiler goes through that phase uh, five, we're into phase six. If there's some issue on the moving the heat out of the boiler and it creates the uh, burner hitting set point too quickly and cycling, that can cause that calibration fault EB as well. So things like boiler sensors, if they start drifting, our area not so much of an issue. Sometimes with harder water deposits and stuff, you might have uh, some problems here. Uh, we don't come across a lot on the west coast here. Uh, but you can ohm out that uh, sensor, and if it's drifting, it usually drifts when it starts to rise in temperature, so it's always good to, to have the boiler kind of operating and measure that with a good reference of what the actual temperature is. And if it's drifting, you want to replace that uh, that sensor. So you measure in, in K ohms, it's a 10K NTC sensor. Inner manual will have a graph there to relate that resistance to temperature, and if that's the issue, you want to uh, replace that. That will cause boiler cycling. Our circulators, for those of you who have come to Wiesman training, uh, we give out the swag here, the little Wiesman pump testers. Everybody likes those when I hand them out. Uh, they're not really a great tool to diagnose issues with your circulators, unfortunately. They will tell you you've got power if the pump uh, spins, the little indicator spins there, but they don't tell you that impeller is actually moving any fluid through the system. So properly, typically we take a, an ammeter, uh, find your line voltage, uh, easiest at the pump module at the bottom of the boiler, uh, and uh, put your ammeter across that. Measure the amps in relationship to the circulator. And I like to do this after uh, an operation of the pump for a while. So if you're in a system and you got an EB fault, you hit the reset button and the boiler fires up and operates, that pump may be cold and that amp draw might be appropriate. Give it 15, 20 minutes, like a domestic hot water draw or something like that, and then test that amp rate as well to see what's going on there. Or sometimes you go and just touch the pump and it's really, really hot. That's a really good indication if the water around it's cold that you got a problem with that particular circulator and that's caught, that can cause your EB faults. The flow switch, obviously on our boilers, is another area. Uh, you can measure continuity across the flow switch. I've tested this. Uh, and if you just cycle the flow switch on and off uh, on operation uh, quickly, you end up with an E2 fault, not an EB fault. But what I'm thinking about here is over time of operation there, if that, uh, if that uh, flow switch starts to become an issue uh, as the burner's in operation, uh, you could have some problems. So just check out the condition of your flow switches there, if they're gummed up, et cetera. Easy to check right at the port here for continuity uh, on those two little uh, poles that you see me holding up there for, for operation. So these will affect the flow right through there. And off, obviously things like pressure in the boiler as well would need to be checked, right? Make sure you have enough pressure to move the water around the system adequately. There's no air in the system. All those things can lead to cycling of the burner and of course the EB fault to occur. So that is all I have for you guys today. Uh, I really appreciate you kind of hanging in there. Uh, I didn't expect it to go after this long. I, I tend to ramble sometimes. I uh, apologize for that, but I really hope you've, you've, you've got a couple little nuggets here that you can carry with you um, as we move forward here. Uh, as Mark mentioned, we will archive this presentation. Uh, so if you know people that had to leave or couldn't make it today, you can let them know to check out our YouTube channel there. Uh, Beastman North America YouTube channel, uh, and we've got a myriad of, of videos and, and uh, presentations in there that you can uh, utilize. And again, we're just trying to grow that uh, list for you guys to be able to utilize uh, when, say, tech support's not available for you. You've got some sort of reference that you can look at um, moving forward. So thank you very much. Uh, I guess we'll have a look at questions if we have any questions, Mark. We've been uh, answering the questions kind of in real time here by typing like a mad fiend. Um, nice. I apologize for my typing because I'm a two-finger typer, uh, but I think we covered everything. The only question that I, we ended up with at the end was the uh, difference between an EB and EE and an E7, and I think really the difference of an E7 is that it actually doesn't actually make a flame, uh, where the EB and EE are both uh, the, something happened when the flame was created, it didn't stay or whatever. So uh, again, all related to the combustion chamber. Yes. Um, yeah. so, the, the thing with Lambda Pro, I guess, as well, just for guys who are still there, is that uh, you just don't get a generic fault 
on ignition if there's a problem, but it can be very specific. And some of those things can overlap a little bit to a degree. Some of the things that you check are the same, but yeah, it's a good point. Yeah, and generally, if you end up with more than one fault, let's say you have an EB and an E7 fault in the same in the fault history, go to the older one and fix it first, because generally, sometimes the second one causes is caused by the first one. So uh, that's right. kind of a, a heads up on troubleshooting there. So um, um, we had a lot of questions, a lot of a lot of uh, uh, good information, but uh, I think I responded to everybody. So if you uh, if you need more information on that, we'll certainly get. Um, a copy of the PDF. Uh, somebody asked me if we could do that. So we'll send a PDF copy out to everybody who attended. They have their email address. We'll just email it to you. And uh, one other thing, um, and I, maybe I missed it when I was typing so quickly, but uh, the fault code checker is a good place to go to troubleshoot these because uh, and you can get that through the VOrange app or through the website under the toolbox. Uh, and uh, those are good places to go for manuals and troubleshooting help. Absolutely. All right, so that's, uh, I guess that we'll, we'll close it up here and uh, I just want to uh, encourage you guys to, to look out uh, in the future here. We'll be, uh, we'll be doing some more webinars in the, in the near future on different topics and uh, we'll be doing a little blast on those uh, similar to what you guys, how you guys received information on this one. So uh, thank you for joining us and uh, until next time, bye-bye.